นะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมบุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมบุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมบุทธัสสะบุตรังธรรมังสังขังนมัสสามิโดยทีมของวันนี้คือเรื่องเกี่ยวกับการถอดถอนและถอดถอนและถอดถอนนะครับนี่คือคำถามที่ฟังมาจากปัญหาที่เกิดขึ้นในช่วงเวลาที่ผ่านมาและที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาและที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมาที่ผ่านมา Request suggestions, and then uh, from a, a long, long list of possibilities, then I pick out uh, uh, 12 or 13 different titles for each of the Sunday afternoons. So this one appeared, uh, off, jumped off, jumped off the page, and I thought, well, that's a good one, <laughs> um, a good uh, theme to explore for the day. So the um, uh, the question, you know, when to attach, when to let go. First of all, it reminded me of the uh, famous. Soliloquy from Hamlet. Please come in, take a seat. The famous soliloquy from Shakespeare's play Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, where he's trying to decide what to do. So the prince uh, Hamlet has um, discovered that his uncle has very, very likely murdered his father and uh, married his mother, and uh, his uh, his deceased father has come to him and. Uh, Uh, in a, as a ghost and told him what's happened, and so he's trying to decide what to do. So this speech of to be or not to be, that is the question. That's when that that gets spoken in the play. It's in slightly antiquated English, so I'll repeat it in the original and then translate it for you. <laughs> so, to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or To take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing, end them. So translated into modern-day English for ordinary humans <laughs> means: So, what should I do? Uh, do I um, contend against the, the the way things are? Do I uh, make a, a fuss and and out my uncle for his uh, uh, egregious behaviour, his murdering of the, my father, the king, and uh, and. Uh, Uh, taking my mother as his queen, uh, or do I just remain passive? Do I stay quiet and, and do nothing? What should I do? That's the interpretation of the uh, of the soliloquy, as I understand it. So, so should we, we should we attach or should we let go? What, what should we uh, what should we do with this, the many and various situations that we we meet in our life in the in our family life, in the workplace, in with our spiritual life, uh, just Um, in negotiating painful feelings in the body during a period of meditation, <laughs> should I uh, attach to my posture or should I let go of it and change my posture? So these uh, are questions that come up in internally, externally, socially, uh, and in public life as well in the whole sort of social arena. These are, are um, questions that, that come up. So uh, if uh, we're acquainted with Buddhist teachings. Please take a seat. Anyway, if we're acquainted with Buddhist teachings, then um, uh, we see right there in the sort of core teaching of the Four Noble Truths, uh, the cause of dukkha, of dissatisfaction, of uh, of suffering, is uh, is craving or clinging, uh, attachment. Um, that's the the cause of suffering. So therefore, it can easily come across. Will be understood that every kind of attachment, every kind of of, um, of desiring uh, and or holding on is is harmful, is obstructive, is a cause of more difficulty and dukkha. But uh, looking at the title and reflecting on this, I thought, well, it's uh, it's good to point out that not every kind of attachment is intrinsically harmful or problematic. In, in fact, some kinds of attachment. Are highly praised, highly recommended by the Buddha in, in his teaching. So, for example, um, the uh, 
in the, the list of the ten parameters, the ten spiritual qualities that are, are sort of necessary for, um, say, full, uh, full enlightenment, and is sort of traditionally spoken of as the ten perfections that are brought to completion in the career of a bodhisattva, one who is dedicated to full enlightenment as a Buddha, um, one of those, uh, uh, those uh, say, parameters, one of those, those spiritual qualities is aditana, which means resolution or, uh, or commitment. So right, you know, right there, that's a form of attachment, I would say. Aditana, resolution, not budging from your commitment, not, uh, not wavering from your, your, your resolution. So that is something that, that's significant. And, um, and interestingly enough, um, there's a, uh, in that respect, there's a, a sutta uh, called the, uh, the Greater Discourse in the Gosinga Forest. And uh, it's, quite, it's quite sweet, quite, quite, uh, quite moving uh, as a teaching because uh, it starts off with, uh, I, I think it's uh, 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 one of, the, I think one of the, the senior disciples of the Buddha, I believe it's Ananda, who's sitting in the forest on this uh, moonlit night, thing, and this thought arises, wow, this is a beautiful um, moonlit night in the, in the Gosinga forest. The air is filled with fragrance. Uh, the moonlight is illuminating the, the forest. It's as if the, the air is filled with, with divine qualities. Uh, what kind of a, of a monastic, what kind of a, a summoner, a meditator, would illuminate, would, would uh, uh, say, be a blessing to the forest on a night like this? And then this thought having uh, arisen, or maybe it's Sariputta who has that first thought. Uh, anyway, so uh, Sariputta then goes to uh, uh, the, his friend um, Ananda and, and says, well, what do you think, Ananda? This is a beautiful moonlit night. Um, what kind of a monk would I illuminate the forest on a night like this? And then Ananda says, well, one who has memorized all the teachings. <laughs> yeah, one who has, has learned the words of the master and can recollect them all perfectly. Uh, that's the kind of monk that would illuminate the forest on a night like this. And then they go, well, let's go ask Moggallana. And then they, they go to Moggallana, and Moggallana says, well, the kind of monk who has completely perfected all of the, the psychic powers and can move between worlds, can fly through the air, can, can uh, read people's minds and uh, carry out all kinds of um, uh, psychic, uh, uh, has all kinds of psychic abilities. So then they go to, you know, one after another, they visit the other elders, and each one talks about their own speciality. So Ananda is very memorious. He's got a brilliant uh, kind of recall. Um, Moggallana's got very uh, abundant psychic powers. And they, are, they go and ask Mahakasava, and he says, well, the kind of monk who has very few needs, who's a, who carries out all the Dutanga practices, who has a very austere life. So each one is kind of in a kind of sweet, slightly, no, I wouldn't say ego-centered way, but just saying, <laughs> this is my speciality. This is what I value in my life and what I've perfected. And then they think, uh, finally they think, well, let's go and ask the master. Let's go and, uh, we've all been around and uh, asked each other, what does the master say? And then they go to the Buddha and say, you know, Venerable Sir, you know, we've all uh, shared our thoughts on what kind of a monastic would illuminate the forest, would be a, a decoration, an embellishment of the beautiful Gosinga forest on a night like this with the, the, the moonlight and fragrances of, of the, the flowers filling the air. And then the Buddha says, uh, one who has uh, made the resolution, I will sit down at this spot and I will not move until complete and perfect enlightenment has been realized. So uh, each one of them talks about their speciality and the Buddha refers to his speciality as aditana, as resolution. So <laughs> attachment. <laughs> So that kind of not wobbling from a from a commitment, though my and when he's uh, he's made that gesture just before his enlightenment, his internal resolution is whether my blood dries up or my bones turn to dust, I will not leave this spot until full and complete enlightenment has been realized. So also just in our ordinary daily lives, the attachment of of uh, a faithfulness to a marriage partner. Um, is uh, uh, keeping our promises, you know, saying you're going to do something and being true to your word. These are these are kinds of attachment that are very honourable, very very uh, noble, and very very skillful. Um, or, or, or speaking of the bodhisattva, you know, the, the bodhisattva vow that, uh, according to our Buddhist mythology, that a, a great being makes a vow, just as the the um, the the Buddha Gotama 
uh, interestingly enough, as uh, the Brahmin called Sumedha from the city of Amaravati, four incalculable periods and a hundred thousand eons ago, there was a city called Amaravati, and a Brahmin there called Sumetha, who then uh, left the home life and became a wanderer. And then when he uh, met the Buddha Dipankara, uh, he uh, lay down, there was, it was a muddy road, uh, and uh, the, the Brahmin Sumetha laid down over this, this puddle and uh, <clears throat> so that the Buddha Dipankara wouldn't get his feet muddy. And then the Buddha Dipankara said, please get up, Brahmin. Uh, Tathagatas do not knowingly tread upon living beings. So, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, nice gesture, but please, you, know, you don't have to bother. So. And then he asked uh, if he could make the vow to be a bodhisattva, uh, to be a bodhisattva and to become a Buddha in the future. And the Buddha Dipankara said, yes, indeed, and your vow will be fulfilled. And in the future, your name will be Gautama Buddha and your chief disciples will be Sariputta Moggallana. Um, so uh, interestingly enough, Lumpur Sumato chose the name for this monastery without knowing that story which is slightly spooky, but that's the, that's the, I, I was the one who told him. And I, I discovered it in a, 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 a book of um, uh, Buddhist, uh, Buddhist history and the life of the Buddha, uh, yeah, four incalculable periods and a hundred thousand eons ago in a city called Amaravati, there lived a Brahmin called Sumetha. And I thought, wow, Ajahn Sumetha, he's very confident and <laughs> he's very, very, comp uh, very competent, very confident, but uh, yeah, naming your monastery after this story, uh, that, that's a bit strong, I embarrassedly thought. Uh, and then when I, I kind of casually mentioned that to him, oh, uh, when he was about to open this place in 1983, uh, he made the, they made the announcement that Amrav, uh, Amravati was going to be opening up as a, a new center. I uh, said, oh, Tanajan, uh, I, I realized where you got the name from. And he said, oh, where's that? And I said, well, you know, in that history, in the, the time of the Buddha Dipankara, there was a Brahmin called Sumetha who lived in Amaravati, and he made the vow to become a Buddha at the, at the feet of the Buddha Dipankara. And we, we were walking across Iping Common at that time, just the two of us on, on the arms round together. He stopped dead in his tracks, went completely white. And I didn't know. So those of you who might have thought, well, that's a bit cheeky of Ajahn Sumedho to, to name his place, to put himself in the position of the Bodhisattva Gautama. He didn't, at least not consciously. It was a coincidence. So, uh, <clears throat> but since that time, he's been given lots of Sumetha rupas. They're quite common in Myanmar, the, of the Brahmin Sumetha lying down on the ground with his hands in Anjali at the, the feet of the Buddha Dipankara. So that kind of a vow to go through uh, countless lifetimes developing the ten parameters in order to realize uh, uh, Buddhahood, to become a, a Sama Sambuddha, that's also a kind of an attachment. So uh, in presenting this or, or exploring this theme, I wouldn't want people to think every kind of attachment is intrinsically harmful or obstructive. Some attachments are, are useful. So uh, at the other end of the scale, another teaching um, in the, uh, uh, that Gosinga Sutta is in the middle length discourses. Uh, another one there, it's Sutta number 37, is called the Shorter Discourse on the Destruction of Craving. And in this, there's a dialogue between the, the Buddha and, uh, and Indra and Saka, the, the, the ruler of the heaven of the 33 gods. And in, this, in that teaching, he makes a very profound statement, a very meaningful, uh, a very, uh, say, uh, p profound and significant declaration. Uh, the Buddha says, uh, uh, nothing whatsoever should be clung to. Sabe dhamma nalang abhinivesaya. Don't cling to anything. Uh, uh, if you've heard this, you've heard everything. If you've practiced this, you've practiced everything. If you've realized the truth of this, then you've realized everything. And Ajahn Buddha Dasa, who uh, was a great uh, teacher and uh, a writer and significant spiritual uh, figure in Thailand, he said, if you, if you take that sutta to heart, you, you can see that the Buddha summed up the entire teaching, the entire Tipitaka in four words, sabe dhamma nalang abhinivesaya, don't cling to anything, don't cling to anything. <laughs> That's the whole deal. If you've heard that, you've heard everything. If you practice that, you've practiced everything. If you realize that, if that's really known in the heart, then we, we, we know everything. It's all the information we need to realize complete and full enlightenment, just four words. So those of you with memory problems, 
four words is not much, and even if <laughs> even writing it down, it's just not even one line. One line in your in your notebook. Don't cling to anything. So clinging is highlighted in that teaching as the the key issue and the the uh, importance of letting go. And so, uh, uh, and then in other teachings, the the different kinds of clinging are highlighted as. Uh, first of all, the word for clinging or grasping is upadana, uh, upadana, which also means fuel, like like um, petrol or gas or firewood is is also upadana, is fuel. So the the uh, the four kinds of fuel or four kinds of clinging. Uh, first of all, clinging to sense pleasure, kama upadana. So the that attachment to to pleasurable sensory experiences, what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and um, what we think. Uh, so Kamupadana, K long A M, Kamupadana. And then the second one is um Silabat Upadana, clinging to conventions, to rituals, to forms, uh to to our uh, conditioned value systems, social value systems, uh, attachment to conventions, Silabat Upadana, um clinging to rites and rituals, this is the right way to bow, this is the right way to bow, that's the wrong way to bow. <laughs> this is the, uh, this, uh, this activity is important and it's good and real and this activity is completely a waste of time. So, like, uh, uh, I've been using the Olympic Games as a good example, as that's been going on these days, that uh, within the Olympic, I'm not, I'm not making fun of that, I used to be a sports person myself, I was a, I was a captain of the rugby team and a, and a uh, county athlete in Kent, back a long time, long, long time ago. So, so I'm not belittling the world of athletics and sports and such like. But uh, if you focus on a particular set of behaviours, like I was a hurdler, believe it or not, with my short legs. But in junior hurdles, I was quite quick. So. <laughs> but uh, so that running along a piece of uh, of ground and, and moving the body over these barriers. Uh, as quickly as possible is taken as having intrinsic value if you're a hurdler. Um, if you look at that objectively or semi-objectively, semi you might think, well, what use is that? <laughs> or why does that have value? Or synchronized swimming or dressage on horseback. I was also a horse rider. I was not very good at dressage. I didn't win any, win any prizes for that. But these are very specific behaviors. If you're into dressage, what you can do on the back of the horse and what the horse can do is extremely significant. Uh, but if you're a pole vaulter, dressage is not so significant. <laughs> and if you're not interested in sports at all, it's just what a waste of time. Like, I mean, I'm interested in Buddhism and meditation. Sports are just totally useless. It's ritual combat, pa, you know, who needs that? So, Silabhat Upadana is clinging to your own particular forms so that maybe you're clinging to meditation as being important and dressage is not. <laughs> Or you're clinging to to dressage or hurdling is important and and uh, medita sitting still with your eyes closed, just breathing for an hour. Why bother? You're breathing anyway. What's the point of that? So silabat upadana is clinging to conventions, to forms, to structures. Dit upadana, the other, this other kind of clinging, is uh, clinging to views and opinions. So your your ideas, your beliefs, that sense of I'm right, you're wrong, uh, this is uh, I know what's true, and that sense of believing our thoughts, believing our, our our ideas as somehow intrinsically and absolutely true. So attachment to to views and opinions. Dit ditty is an, a view or an opinion, and then the last of the four that are usually highlighted is called atavad upadana, which is atta means the self. So clinging to ideas about yourself, basically being fascinated with your own story, or being uh, uh, being um, say lost in your own story, being whether you like your story or you don't like your story, just uh, that who you are, your name, your occupation, where you live, your nationality, your age, your <laughs> your uh, your height, your qualifications, your lack of qualifications, your successes, your failures, that in a sense, attaching to your story as having uh, intrinsic value and meaning. So these are the, just briefly four kinds of clinging. So all of those, those kinds of clinging definitely lead towards more alienation, insecurity, discontent, and disharmony within us. So that if there is that kind of clinging to sense pleasure, to uh, uh, to conventions, to views and opinions, or to 
to uh, to your feelings of self, to your ego, and to your life story, then that's a direct track to more d uh, discontent, conflict, uh, insecurity, and and um, alienation. Uh, so the the uh, um, so I feel in, in this area, it's really helpful to understand the difference between skillful holding and clinging. And this is a, if those of you who've listened or, or read uh, Ajahn Chah's teachings, um, listen to his teachings, you'll know this is a very frequent theme in Lumpo Chah's uh, Dhamma teachings, the difference between holding and clinging. And uh, he, would, he would address this area quite often, and he would say sometimes people think that uh, Buddhism is about letting go and about non-attachment, so therefore we shouldn't pick anything up. We shouldn't take responsibility. We shouldn't carry out any kind of activity, any kind of doing or any kind of, of, um, uh, of say, picking up a, a, a piece of work or a project or a, uh, an activity uh, is somehow an intrusion upon our peacefulness, uh, any kind of, of holding. But uh, he says it's not the case because we can, we can pick something up can hold uh, hold an object. Yeah, it's being held. There is there's there's effort being made. I'm picking up the water bottle, uh, picking up a glass of water. I put the bottle down because I've finished with that example of picking up the glass of water because I'm thirsty. <laughs> and then when you don't need it anymore, you put it down. So and that was exactly the kind of example he would use. He'd pick up a glass and say, "There's nothing unskillful or problematic in holding." That, and this is, we, we hold our, uh, the health of our body. We hold our relationship to other people in the community. We hold the, the work that we do. Uh, we pick that up and we can carry that out without clinging, without, without stress, without identification, without grasping. So, and he would point out that's how we bring goodness and value into our life is a lot through skillful holding. Um, if that holding then becomes like, you're not going to take this glass away from me, you know, prize this from my cold, dead hand, you know, no one's going to take my glass of water away from me, then, which is kind of ridiculous, but we can hang on to things like that, <laughs> then it becomes uh, problematic. So I feel in this area, I'm getting a sense for the difference between holding and clinging is, is really crucial. And so uh, where... Um, uh, you know, Ajahn Chah would often point out, because people would come to him and they'd say, well, how can you possibly live with non-attachment? How can you live in a life free of grasping? You've got to feed yourself. You've got to look after your family. If you're in the monastery, you've got to you know, carry out your, your duties. You've got to, uh, to um, you know, follow the routine. You know, uh, isn't this all a, an intrusion upon our peacefulness or some kind of imposition on, on our life? So over and over again, he would, <laughs> he would be explaining this point say no, that uh, when we talk about non-attachment or we talk about non-grasping, it doesn't mean never doing anything. It doesn't mean uh, never carrying out any work. And looking at not just Ajahn Chah's life where he did a lot, uh, was teaching people every day for hours, 10, 12, 15 hours uh, a day, he'd be available to give teachings to people or the life of the Lord Buddha himself. He did a lot of stuff. Again, I, I like to point this out. That after the, the enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, and after the uh, appeal by the, by the Brahma deity uh, Sahampati, the Buddha, for 45 years, he traveled around Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Northeast India, and ceaselessly uh, taught people and responded to situations in very skillful ways. He established the Sangha. He spent countless hours, uh, say, codifying the, 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 um, the mode of conduct, the, 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 the training rules for nuns, for monks, uh, the, um, uh, explaining the teachings in, in a thousand different ways for, for monastic disciples, lay disciples. So he was very creative, very innovative, took a lot of action, made a lot of choices, so a lot of doing in the Buddha's life, but none of that was based upon grasping or, or, attack, or clinging. So there was a lot of holding, a lot of doing, a lot of, uh, of engagement, but that was all in that category of skillful holding rather than, than grasping. So I feel this is a, a very uh, important area to, to look at and to, to see that um, those qualities of skillful attachment 
uh, as Ajahn Chah tried to encourage people, as he was a good example of, uh, and I would say, yeah, Lumpur Sumedha, this, this very temple <laughs> that we're sitting in, this monastery that we're in, is because of Lumpur Sumedha holding on to the idea of, we need a bigger place when we were at Chithas. We need a place for the nuns to, uh, community to expand. We need a place to run meditation retreats. And, uh, uh, that's, uh, and he was ready to take action on that. Even though Chithurst Monastery had only been open for uh, about four years at that point, Chithurst opened in 1979. The idea to open Amravati was hatched in 1983, four years after Chithurst began. So uh, Lumpur Sumato confesses that, that there were a number of people in the Sangha and in the English Sangha Trust who thought he was completely nuts. <laughs> we haven't even finished repairing the, the, the house at Chithurst and we already we need a, you want a bigger place but they had enough confidence in, in Lumpur's vision and his initiative and, uh, and, that, uh, and also his capacity they said okay let's do it and this place was found so we are in this building because of the skillful holding of Lumpur Sumedha holding on to that idea holding on to that vision and then it's ripened in this place, this, com uh, this community, uh, and this very building where we are sitting uh, today, 40 years later. We just had our 40th birthday. Uh, last last uh, Sunday was the 40th anniversary. So uh, in our spiritual training, there are various areas where that kind of skillful holding is really essential. And so we, like in, in the monastic tradition, we have what are called the dutangas or the ascetic practices. So you make a resolution. Uh, these are the 13 kinds of, of uh, austere practices that the Buddha allowed for his, his monastic community. Uh, he didn't uh, allow self-torture, but he did, uh, there were certain uh, areas uh, of, uh, of conduct that he said, okay, you can tighten things up in those particular areas. And they are to do with food, sleep, physical comfort and personal space. So all kind of reptile brain areas. <laughs> so, so, uh, so with respect to food, you could make a, a resolution, an aditana, just to eat the food that you receive on the arms round in the morning and not accept anything else. And that's a fairly common practice uh, in, uh, in our community, uh, different countries. Um, you can Make a resolution just to use three postures, not to lie down. So sitting, standing, and walking only, and not to lie down. So that's another uh, f uh, reasonably common uh, resolution. So that, uh, uh, and then, or in terms of, of clothing, you can uh, make the resolution just to have the, for a monk, just to have the three robes, um, uh, and to, to make do with, with that for all the clothing that you have. In terms of personal space, to not live in a building, but to just uh, live out under the trees. Um, again, that's quite a, a strong part of our tradition, going on, on these long, too long walks or living in the forest and living under a mosquito net or a, in a tent. So these ways that the Buddha allowed, so you make a resolution. And as a junior person, you have to ask permission of the teacher. And so, say for example, when I was a junior monk, uh, at Chithurst in the early days, I had been a monk for about one or two years, I asked uh, uh, Ajahn Sumato, I said, uh, Tanajan, I'd like to make the resolution to just, uh, just have the meal uh, and just uh, outside the meal just have water for the whole of the three months of the rains retreat. So uh, there, wasn't, there wasn't any breakfast in those days anyway. It was just a cup of tea. <laughs> that, that was breakfast was a cup of tea in those days, back in the old days. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, nothing, no, no tea at tea time or no kind of allowables like dark chocolate and such like. So just have the meal and water for the three months. But you'd have to ask the teacher. So uh, the Buddha realized that you could get a bit overzealous as a junior person. And uh, one of Ajahn Sumato's uh, early Western disciples, uh, a, um, uh, an Am uh, American monk who'd been in the Marine Corps before he entered the Sangha, at the beginning of their first rains retreat at, at the International Monastery, Wat Nanashat, um, uh, and traditionally, back in, in, uh, in the kind of the classical times, uh, you, at the beginning of the rains retreat, you sort of go around the Sangha and, and people would declare what kind of special practices, what kind of dutangas they'd like to do. And this particular monk, the former Marine, said, I want to do all 13, Ajahn. <laughs> he said, no, no, you might have been a Marine, but this is, uh, that's too much. <laughs> Let's pick one or two. So that's, again, you attach yourself to a standard and then you learn from that, 
that commitment. Um, similarly, I would say um, the practice of patience when you're living with discomfort or a, a, a difficult living with a difficult family member or having some kind of crisis in the in your in your working life, being patient uh, with difficult uh, emotions, difficult. Uh, relationships and different difficult situations. Suddenly, your company's uh, lost piles of money, and you're, you're looking like you're deeply in debt. What do you do? You're, someone in your family is having a, an emotional crisis. What do you do? Uh, you're you're sitting in meditation, and you're you're feeling a, a lot of physical pain. What do you do? So the cultivation of patience uh, again is a, there's a, the use of 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 uh, attachment you say oh, no i'm not going to panic i'm not going to just react uh, impulsively i'll stay with this for a bit and and look explore so that attachment to uh, being patient i would say or the, that the use of patience the kanti paramita one another of the 10 paramitas uh, k h a n t i kanti paramita is uh, it helps us to be responsive to life rather than reactive so that even if things are difficult socially, emotionally, physically, then there's a, well, wait a minute, let's not panic. <laughs> let's just, just open the mind, open the heart up to the situation and, and get a feeling for what's, what's here before we do anything. Then, uh, so uh, patience and faithfulness in relationships. Um, you know, our commitment as monastics is, a, is, a, is a, uh, uh, say a, an agreement, a set of relationships. We, we uh, agree to, to abide by certain uh, rules, principles, precepts in, in a committed relationships, so a marriage or a partnership, being faithful to your partner. If uh, you, you have made those commitments, those vows, as it's a marriage or a, or a civil partnership or an informal agreement, just being true to your promises, being faithful to your, your partner, uh, that creates a lot of space in our, our life. There's a quality of trust and, and ease in each other's company. Um, so that that is a, of something that is very, it's an attachment, but it's a skillful, uh, uh, hopefully, <laughs> it's a skillful attachment that creates a very beneficial I environment uh, to, uh, uh, to be living in and to, to be providing for yourself and for others. And then I would say then just keeping the precepts that... Uh, uh, and every every week here as a as a weekly um, as a ritual, and people determine the three refuges, the five precepts. Again, that's an attachment. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. That's a commitment. It's a, it's an attachment um, to a principle, but ideally, it's a skillful attachment. If it's unskillful, then we uh, hate ourselves if we if we go against it, or we get critical and, and angry with other people if they don't keep it. <laughs> and so, the wrong grasping of sila can make a lot of stress and hate, self hatred for ourselves, or make us feel very proud and critical of others, um, very um, making ourselves very superior. Like, well, I keep the precepts, not like you. So that you can take uh, something that's supposedly virtuous and beneficial and make it into a, a weapon to attack other people. But uh, ideally, that kind of attachment is useful. So uh, this is all based on that those attachments being applied skillfully. So sometimes we can be, we can be unskillful, we can be really rigid in terms of our, our uh, attachments, and then it goes into the realm of grasping, which leads to, to suffering. So again, going back to those... Um, to Tungas and back to that that year when I, I took the, the 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 vow the resolution to only have the the, the one meal and you know everything in my one bowl one meal and then nothing else but but water uh, outside of that so uh, I was a very zealous young monk I was about 23 to 24 years old at that time pretty an ardent keen young lad and um so uh, that t during that time, there was the opening of the Peace Pagoda in Milton Keynes, and the uh, the Japan uh, uh, Buddha Sangha uh, uh, Nipponzan uh, Myohoji, uh, they uh, had a, a peace conference that they they held at that time, and uh, Lumpur Sumedho was invited to go along to be part of that as this dedication of the new stupa, the Peace Pagoda at Milton Keynes. So he took me along as a sort of junior monk and attendant. 
and I think to give me a bit of a break from being the <laughs> Uh, sort of uh, uh, overzealous uh, uh, monk at, at Chithurst in those days. And uh, anyway, so about two or three days into the conference, in the mid-afternoon, it was uh, this. It was summertime, and uh, uh, that sort of mid-afternoon, 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the sort of lull of energy. And the Allegarica, uh, the, the, the uh, postulant who was with us, was particularly gifted at finding allowables. So those particular kinds of tonics and medicines that are, uh, don't count as food, but they count as medicines or tonics, like dark chocolate or you know, sugar, uh, uh, palm sugar and such like juggery and uh, those kind of things that are allowable in the afternoon. So he was particularly adept at finding interesting and, uh, and potent allowables. So during this afternoon break, then uh, he produced from his bag uh, these two... Uh, dark chocolate covered toffee bars and he had uh, checked the ingredients and they were all in the allowable zone and so he offered these to 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 uh, Lumpur Sumato and then Lumpur Sumato held one out to me and I gave him this look that said but Tanajan surely you remember I've made this resolution you know because I asked permission to have nothing but but water outside the meal and he gave me this look that said yes I know And he was not withdrawing his hand. And so I thought, well, this, this feels like a teaching. This is not just the, the Ajahn forgetting. Um, uh, he's, he remembers and he's still holding out the, the toffee, uh, the chocolate covered toffee bar to me. So I thought, well, this is a teaching. He's the teacher. Okay. Uh, and so I took, the, I took the toffee bar and he said, phew. <laughs> yeah. And then he said, I thought we had another Santa Chito on our hands. And Ajahn Santajito, of of dear memory, <laughs> he uh, he passed away. Uh, he, uh, he disrobed uh, about twenty years ago, but uh, passed away um, a, f a few years back. He was famous for his slightly bonkers kind of resolutions that everyone in the, in the community had to then deal with. That uh, he would make these very ardent, uh, heroic resolutions and then stick to them and. Uh, other people had to kind of work around them, like chaining himself to the pillar in the middle of the sala. He, he was trying to keep the, the practice of not lying down, and he kept finding himself curled up on the floor of his kuti. So he, he tied himself to the pillar in the middle of the, the main meditation hall. So then the other monks and novices would come in in the morning, and he'd be kind of still tied to the pillar, snoring, while they were having the morning puja around him. So. Of dear memory, Santajito. There's many Santajito stories. Uh, that's just one of them. But, uh, so, so anyway, that was what uh, Lumpur said. Phew, I thought we had another Santujito on our hands. So I thought, oh, this is definitely a teaching. <laughs> so, uh, so that was, um, I, I felt, okay, uh, you know how to hold on, do you know how to let go? So we can sometimes, we make resolutions, we make commitments, we make promises, but then it becomes really destructive, or the way we're holding that is not helpful to ourselves or to others it's not it's creating more problems more difficulties and that uh, our sense of sincerity or try me me trying to do the right thing um is getting in the way of really doing the right thing <laughs> really uh, say uh, adapting to circumstances and being flexible and so that that um uh, I feel is the kind of one of the key pieces of, the, of this uh, area of reflection and, and exploration that um, we have a certain standard, we have a certain form, but then we're, we're alive, we're living in the world, we have a body, we have a mind, we're living in society, we're living on a planet. Life is not under personal control and we can't always act perfectly in accordance with our preferred uh, principles. Another example from even earlier was when um, uh, Ajahn Sumedho first came to, um, to England with Ajahn Chah in 1977. Um, then that, uh, at that time, the uh, Thai international, um, the, uh, uh, the flights didn't go all the way from, from, I don't think they could go all the way from Thailand to, to London. They had a, a stopover or a couple of stopovers along the way. And... As they were, um, uh, they were coming into to land in Rome, I think it was. Then they, the pilot put a message over the PA saying, 
Um, we're not sure whether the wheels have come down. We can't tell. Um, so we might have to make an emergency landing at Rome Airport. So get ready. So uh, Ajahn Chah found that the queues of people on the plane coming up asking for blessings from him. <laughs> and the cabin staff trying to get them to sit down. Well, they wanted this you know, high-ranking sort of holy man up at the front to give blessing and protection. And they're all, you know, very, very sort of devoutly asking for Lord Paul's blessing. Anyway, they, 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 they came down low the, from the, the, um, the tower. They could see the wheels had come down, but they made an emergency landing at, at Rome. Uh, and uh, they all had to get off the plane uh, onto the, the, the tarmac at, at Rome Airport. And so Lumpur Cha, kind of being uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, polite monk that, that he was, uh, he let you know, everybody else get off the plane first, and then he and, and uh, Ajahn Sumato, who was, he was uh, fairly young then, he was only about 12, 12 reigns at that point. No, about 10, 10 reigns, 10 reigns, uh, 10 years as a monk. So they got onto the tarmac, and then everyone was, had to get onto these, the, this bus to leave the plane and get to the, to the terminal. And it just so happened that the, up at the top of the steps into the bus, there was a, a wall of women. There were all women standing at the top of the steps. And in uh, forest monastic life, we're very, very strict observance of the, of the precepts. And so you'd, as a monk, you would never physically come in, in contact with a woman if you could avoid it. Or for a nun, she'd never physically come in contact with a male if, if it can be avoided. So. And, and Lumpur Sumedha tells this story that standing on the tarmac, you know, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? You know, because it was packed, the bus was packed with everyone from the plane, on, you know, squished in. And uh, Lumpur Cha you know, looked at the bus and looked at Ajahn Sumedha and just walked up the steps and kind of squished himself into the, <laughs> into the crowd and said, come on, Sumedha, get on the bus. You know, it was unavoidable. Otherwise, what are you going to do? Say, get off the bus and only have males standing there. But it was, Ajahn Cha thought, no, that's... That's clinging to, clinging to precepts, just if you can't stop the world, stop your mind. So that was uh, his, uh, his approach. So uh, in terms of, uh, of this principle then, when to attach, when to let go, um, when to act, when to not act, or when to hold on, when to, when to relinquish, um, it really hinges around wisdom uh, and uh, one of the, the again, the, the significant teachings from the middle length discourses is called the Bade Karata Sutta. That's number 131 of the Majima Nikaya, the middle length discourses. And it, it's uh, variously translated um, uh, uh, in the translation by Bhikkhu Nyanamoli and Bhikkhu Bodhi, it's called One Fortunate Attachment. Uh, and there's, again, speaking about attachment to opinions, Ditu Padana, there's serious disagreement about the translation of the title. Some people say, no, 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 it means one fortunate day and, yeah, one fortunate day and night because of the word rati, badeka rata or rata, it can be translated in different ways. No, no, it's not, it's not a fortunate attachment, it's a fortunate day and night. So there's differences of opinion <laughs> amongst the uh, community on which is the, the correct interpretation. Anyway, in Bhikkhu Nyanamoli, Bhikkhu Bodhi's uh, translation, they say they call it one fortunate attachment, and it's a, a very it's a short sutta, but very significant. Where it's the Buddha saying, "Yeah, don't uh, I'll, so I'll teach you about the cultivation of one fortunate attachment. Um, don't dwell upon the past. Uh, don't let your mind dwell in ideas about the future." But uh, in this moment, be awake to the presently aris arisen condition. This is one fortunate attachment. So attaching to the present reality rather than drifting off into uh, the, imagined, the, the remembered past or the imagined future. And so that, that is, in a way, uh, adhere, attaching <laughs> to uh, the here and now reality, the akali kodama, the here and now reality. So it's a kind of an attachment it's, a, it's an adherence to reality. It's a, a, a choosing reality rather than dwelling in mental images of a, of a past, of a, of a memory, or an imagined future. So uh, I'd say that's very, uh, very much a, a support for the, the quality of wisdom and what helps us to uh, make a fortunate attachment, <laughs> make our uh, attachments fortunate. 
But also significant in that is that uh, if there is a real, um, uh, uh, say, a- attachment or, or a- uh, attunement to the present, and then, then the Buddha highlights this in other teachings as well. He says, letting go of the past, letting go of the future, not creating any ideas about the self here in the present. So not dwelling, that letting go of self-view is a, is a key piece to finding a way to make those skillful choices, whether to attach, whether to let go, whether, uh, whether to hold on, whether, whether to act or to be quiet. Um, that uh, letting go of self-view is a, a key piece uh, within that. So the more the mind attunes itself um, to, to, to Dhamma, to reality, and there's a letting go of self-view, a letting go of conceit, uh, and the quality of anatta is, act- is realized, then part of the development of wisdom is the recognition that it's not really to do with letting go because no thing can really be owned in the first place. <laughs> You say, uh, I'm, I am holding on to this thing, I'm holding on to this idea, or I'm holding on to this possession. Well, there might be the thought that you are, but with the development of wisdom, what is there that can be owned? And what, and what is there here that can really own anything? If, that's, if that, that, that is explored through, through, the, through insight meditation, uh, insight into not-self, uh, what is there here uh, that can truly own anything. The body is not self, rupang anatta. Feelings are not self, vedana anatta. Perceptions are not self. So the things we call mine, like my, my yam, which I, I have had this yam since 1986. It's mine, <laughs> but it's not. The, the, the wool that this made was, is made from came from some sheep in Scotland before 1986. <laughs> Some, Frida Wint gave us these spools of wool. Lumpur Sumato crocheted this into a, into a form of a yarn in about 1980, 81, in order to give to Ajahn Chah. That then it got, it got lost. By the time it got found again, and uh, then um, Lumpur Chah had no more need of a yarn, and so uh, it was, uh, a monk made it into this, this form and gave it to me. So, 1986, this particular collection of elements came to me by the then Venerable Gambiro, gave me this yarn, and now it's mine. And I've looked after it as mine, and repaired it many times uh, uh, since 1986, which is uh, 38 years ago. So, uh, but it's not really mine. <laughs> the, the wool uh, belonged to the sheep that were grazing on the Scottish hillside and then <clears throat> before that, it was uh, the grass that the sheep were eating and the earth that the grass was growing from and, and so on and so forth. And then one day, the, the elements that make this up will dissipate and it won't be mine anymore or it'll catch fire or I'll leave it on a plane or uh, it'll be stolen by somebody and it won't be mine anymore. <laughs> so that uh, we call things ours, our body, our, our, our bag, our shoes, our, our house, our, our job, our reputation, but... Um, there isn't really any thing that is solidly there that can be owned. And when we look for what is here in the, in the, the heart or the mind that can really do any owning, again, that, that's all empty. So that this um, uh, looking at, at this area and exploring that with wisdom, I feel this is extremely helpful to say, well, what, what, can, be, uh, what can be held on to and who is there to hold on to it? <laughs> and so, in a sense... There isn't really any letting go. There's a more of a realization of non-ownership. So, and this is one of the ways that the Buddha described Nibbana. He said that there, there is an island that you cannot go beyond. Uh, uh, and it's a place of akinchanang anadanang. It's a place of no-thingness, a place of non-possession. Um, and so that uh, I feel that's a very, uh, very significant teaching. That's from the Sutta Nipata. We, on the, the the collection of teachings about Nibbana that Ajahn Pasana and I put together. That's on the, that's we put that on the back cover. <laughs> that it's a place uh, Nibbana. There is an island that you cannot go beyond. 
It is a place of no thingness, a place of non-possession. So when the heart is truly at peace, part of that peacefulness and that freedom is recognizing no thing can be owned. So it's not really, uh, letting go is, is a, a kind of figure of speech based upon our habits of self-view and the delusion of a person here who can do some owning. If there is wisdom, if there is a clarity of vision, then it's recognized as the talk that I, I was, I was uh, the subject I was reflecting on a couple of weeks ago, there isn't really a person who can own anything and, and, no, and no real thing, no solid thing that can be owned. <sighs> so that letting go is a figure of speech that describes that, in a way, that insight into intrinsic non uh, non-ownership, the uh, the uh, ownerless nature of reality, that the, the world of things uh, is an appearance, it's a, a figure of speech that we talk about things like a building or a person, and and, and ownership. So I feel like that's a, in terms of this area, that's helpful to look at when we say we were struggling with an issue in our family, in the workplace, in the in our meditation. Look at how much I and me and mine is there. How much there's a me who possesses this problem. I've got a problem with my brother. I've got a problem with the business. Or I don't know what to do with my practice. I'm not getting anywhere in my practice. Take the attention off the practice and look at the I who has got a problem with it. <laughs> Take a, a, attention, at least momentarily, away from the, the debt that your company's in and look at the, the me who's responsible for it, who's got to, me who's got to do something about it. And then when that, those feelings of I and me and mine are let go of, are seen through, and then wisdom is allowed to operate, then the landscape changes quite considerably, I would say. Though mysteriously, one of, the, one of the skillful ways, and I don't know if any of you were at the day long in London yesterday, that London Insight, that we kind of addressed the same theme to some degree uh, yesterday at the London Insight event, um, mysteriously, one of the ways that letting go can be uh, actualized and facilitated is to inflate the thing that the mind is hanging on to. This opinion, this worry, this desire, this obsession, this regret, uh, this project, um, that uh, <clears throat> rather than, than saying let go, let go, let go, which can then turn into a kind of a rejection, a sort of um, pushing away, which uh, makes things more solid. Uh, Lumpur Sumedha would encourage what he would call conscious clinging, or thinking the unthinkable. And so uh, looking at the, the, the areas where the mind's getting attached, if you have a conflict with someone, and that's really burdensome, or, or that they're, um, they're causing a lot of difficulties, and to, uh, to rather than, than then dwelling upon, oh, I shouldn't worry about that, I should have loving kindness, I should have compassion, I should let go. Uh, to, to go in the opposite direction, to consciously inflate the issue. Like, if you were different, I would be happy. I am unhappy because of you. If you were different, or if you didn't exist, that would be great. It's a very un-Buddhist, like that's why it's called thinking the unthinkable. Very un-Buddhist, but you know, this is applied with a safety warning. You, know, so you, you can try this at home, but you know, <laughs> the, but uh, it's. A, I found this an extremely helpful practice because, in our efforts to let go, unconsciously we can be um, uh, be basing that on vibhava tanna, the desire to get rid of. Like, I, I'm letting go of this obsession. I'm letting go of this fear. I'm letting go of this desire. I'm letting go of this this uh, conflict, and. There's, there's a me trying to get rid of this thing which is burdening me that's behind that. So this uh, way of inflating the issue, um, like if only my, uh, my family was totally harmonious, we all loved each other, I would be completely happy. If we love, it can, we, you kind of get, can't get to the end of the sentence before you start chuckling because it's like, yeah, right. <laughs> because something in us knows we would find something else to get upset about or obsessed about. We know that. that That's a very, very familiar territory for every one of us. I'm not reading anybody's mind. It's like, how did he know? It's, like, it's not psychic power, it's statistics. Very mundane. This is how we are as human beings. So uh, I do recommend this conscious clinging 
as a as a practice. Don't actually take up any weapons or spend any money. You know, <laughs> like if only I if I had that big house, then I would be totally happy. Then you know, don't. Then well, Ajahn Amaro said if I followed that thought, I, you know, that would relieve me of this problem. I'm now even more in debt than I was before. So it's a it's an internal exercise. It's a thought experiment. It's a kind of internal exercise rather than taking up weapons or spending large amounts of money or moving house or changing country or such like. Uh, if only I was a monk, then I would be happy. If only I wasn't a monk, if I was a nun, yeah, I would be happy. If only I could find the perfect person, if only I could get, get away from the perfect person, then I would be happy. That if you think that through, then and, and when, when uh, Lumpur Saveda first started teaching this in the late 80s, early 90s, I, I, this was before the temple was built, I would really find myself chuckling in the Dhamma Hall sometimes. It's because you can just see your, your fears, your desires, your aversions, your, your uh, anxieties just sort of crumbling in front of you. And not because you sort of logically thought your way through them, but by inflating them, they lose their strength. It's a mysterious chemistry, I found. So I, I do recommend that. Uh, uh, that uh, as a way of of breaking free of this. So in terms of going back to the question, uh, whether to attach, when to attach and when to let go, again, going back to to Hamlet, uh, uh, to to be or not to be. Um, so uh, uh, when we, ha we look at that question, when to, when to attach and when to let go, uh, if it's not based on self-view, uh, when should I attach or I should let go? Um, and then, uh, and if we, if that, air, the area of, of question is viewed with, with, with wisdom, with an openness, with an, uh, with an awareness, then it, it's not simply a choice between is the right thing to do to attach or the right thing to do to let go. But the mind doesn't think in the terms of the right thing. Uh, for me to do, but rather there's an attunement to the situation. And what arises from mindfulness and wisdom is, rather than me making a choice, what arises is from that attunement of your, your jitta, your heart, to the, the experienced situation, is a working with the way things are. So you're not contending against the way things are, or, or um, submitting to the way things are. It's not a matter of contending against or, or submitting to. It's not a matter of being passive uh, with the way things are or contending against the way things are, but from that place of mindfulness and wisdom, there's a working with the way things are, and a not, not a me working with the way things are. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and this is, a, I would, uh, maybe the last thing to, to highlight, that if, uh, if the practice and, our, and effort is based on self-view, me doing something to get some particular result, the, the result will always, always contain some kind of discontent, some kind of disharmony, some kind of dukkha. If instead we practice Dhamma in accordance with Dhamma, it's called Dhamma Nu Dhamma Patipada, if the Dhamma is practiced in accordance with Dhamma rather than in accordance with self-view, so if the, the, the driving force, the guiding force, is mindfulness and wisdom, uh, then the heart is enabled to work with the way things are, and there's a knowing, okay, in this moment it's time to speak up. In this moment it's time to be quiet. <laughs> you don't have a plan or a fixed, uh, uh, a fixed procedure, but there's a, a trusting in awareness and a trusting in the attunement of the heart to the living situation and the responsivity of the, the, the heart uh, based upon and guided by wisdom by awareness and then the result if his uh, practice is based on vicha rather than avijja based on awareness the result is nibbana is peacefulness if our practice is based on avijja on ignorance on self view then the result is always going to be dukkha and that was another of uh, ajahn sumato's sort of pocket aphorisms if you start off with with ignorance you end up with dukkha if you start off with wisdom you end up with nibbana Put that on your T-shirt. <laughs> Arrange the words on your fridge you know, to, to, to remind you. So I offer these thoughts for consideration this afternoon. Thank you, Tanajan. Um, 
my question is on uh, is it a skillful thing to remember and record and uh, revisit uh, wholesome deeds that you carry out during your lifetime um, you know some buddhists believe that you keep a record of you know good things you have done and then read it when you're getting old etc uh, etc et uh, is it a skillful thing or is that also should be let go and <laughs> not cling to the, the good deeds that you do uh, well uh, good question um, when uh, there is a particular practice i like to teach called the death rehearsal and uh, in that i encourage four contemplations um, first of all to recollect the things that um, uh, you've received uh, have uh, been done uh, in your life from outside that have been painful difficult uh, and so to uh, acknowledge those and to forgive those who've done you harm and then to um, to recollect the uh, the things from outside that uh, have been very beneficial and supportive and uh, encouraging and to cultivate appreciation gratitude for those the third contemplation is to look back look back at your life and to recollect the unskillful things you've done and to forgive yourself for those and and then the fourth one is what you're asking about which is to recollect your own wholesome actions and i leave it to last because it's for some people many people it's the most challenging thing so but this is a, a practice that the buddha encouraged it's called chaganusati so we we're familiar with marananusati the contemplation of death or buddha nusati contemplation of the buddha and dhamma and sangha and so on um, but the uh, chaganu sati is recollecting your own goodness okay. and your own generosity and so uh, you're not doing that in order to be inflated or egotistical but rather to recognize the good that has been done to rejoice in that so when we say anumodana i rejoice in the good that's been done it's also helping the person who's been generous or who's carried out some virtuous action for them too to rejoice in the good that's been done so that uh i would say is following the buddha's advice to recollect your own good actions if however it then becomes a a force for supporting self view <laughs> like look at all the wonderful things i've done i'm so great i've built this monastery i've supported the sangha you know i've made piles of merits you know i'm a really good person there's a lot of i am in that <laughs> you know i have done i am and so the degree to which there is self view and and ownership of those good deeds and that'll be an obstruction yes. so that the uh, the most skillful thing is uh, for the good good actions uh, wholesome actions to have been done but without them being claimed or owned or or be, uh, being used to build up self view that's where insight meditation is very very helpful and the the application of those reflections on on not self because uh, uh the the um one of the significant teachings of the buddha on this is uh he says don't be, in the itivutaka he says don't look down on merit don't belittle punya and it seems to be that the unspoken preamble to that is that it sounds like some monk has said uh uh good karma and punya that's a kind of waste of time wisdom that's the only thing that matters you know total liberation um but that bit is left out of the text if that was there but it starts off with the buddha saying don't don't look down upon punya don't belittle merit it merit punya is another word for happiness this is a something very very wholesome a great blessing and a great beauty in our lives so that that rejoicing in the punya that has been done um but without making a, a a lot of ego out of it that's the 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 best way yes thank you so also, as, if you can pass it on to other people as yes yes thank you any other questions yes there's one down here yeah so um i really appreciate today's uh, talk it's about this uh, letting go and um 
you mentioned about the uh, difficult family members. So I, I shouldn't, uh, anyway. So it's always you have these situations where, you know, it's relatively easy to not react to the people not close to you. Mm -hmm. It's always, it's a struggle to not react to the people so close to you. Indeed so. So, <laughs> um, again, you know, like you said, things are not under your control. You know, there are, there are, there are certain circumstances you just can't fulfill their desires, fulfill their demands. And then it's the karma is so strong and you react so quickly. The anger just comes out instantly. So I know some techniques, you know, depressed, things like that, but is there any good advice for you today? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is a very common situation inside monasteries as well as outside. You'll be, uh, I, I'm sure, astonished to hear. Or maybe not astonished. Maybe not astonished. Um, yeah, so that if we only try to work with those things in live situations, it's, it is very challenging. So what we can do is to... Um, work with uh, those uh, relationships in our imagination. Uh, when it's not a live situation, not in the same room or on the same phone call of, as with someone, but you're, you're by yourself uh, sitting in meditation. And to uh, consciously bring to mind that some interaction or just the person's name, um, and then watch the reactive process within you to recollect an argument that's happened or some kind of conflict. Um, so they're not in the room. You're by yourself. It's a completely benign situation. So you're doing that. You're inviting that in, that memory or that, the perception of that, that person in order to explore the reactive process. Right? So uh, it might seem like, why would you want to do that if you want to be peaceful? Well, because. <laughs> uh, if uh, If you... And this was, again, a practice that uh, Ajahn Sumedho taught many years ago that I found very, very helpful. So you don't need the whole story of how they should be and how, what you should have said or what they should have, should, or should have, shouldn't have done. You don't need, you know the story already. So sit down in meditation, let your mind be as, as calm, as quiet as possible. Then just bring their name to mind. Or just, or when, or the last event that you're, struggling with like Tuesday. <laughs> you know what happened, it's all there. So you don't need that much more than a trigger. So you deliberately trigger that memory or that perception of that, that person. Then, this is the tricky bit, then you take your attention off the thought stream, the, the memory or the kind of ideas about it, and you turn the attention and bring it into the body. So where do you feel that sensation of anger? that feeling of resentment or indignation. It, it, it'll have some kind of sensation in the body, a stiffness in your shoulders, a heat in your armpits, a vibration. Some, it'll have some kind of physical connotation, concomitant. So the, the, the trick is then taking your attention off the story, bring it into the body, and then just to consciously feel the sensations of anger, resentment, uh, indignation, and so on. So what does this feel like? Where is this? Without comment, without well, should be there, shouldn't be there, I want this to end, just looking at and knowing, receiving the feeling. And then in that, what we discover is that the physical sensations that go with that emotion are much more workable, much more handleable than the person or the dynamic or the relationship. It's to, this is what anger feels like. This is what indignation feels like. It's exactly this way. And so we find that we can accept and have loving kindness for that sensation. If a stiffness across your shoulders, a tightness in your belly, a heat, then there's something in the heart that recognizes this is just a feeling of heat. It's just a vibration. It's just a sense of tension. It's not even particularly painful. Here it is. It's like this. This is the feeling of anger. So then having triggered that emotion, then to let it be there, let it be sustained for you know, a few minutes, two minutes, five minutes, and then 
to consciously let go, you know, relaxing the body and particularly using the out breath, the exhalation as a way of relaxing and releasing. And sometimes it takes two minutes to trigger it and 45 minutes to let go. <laughs> so, uh, but in, in this practice, it's really important to stay with it, letting go, letting go, breathing out, breathing out, breathing out. And, and then at a certain point, it will have ended. The body will be back to its original state and the mind will be kind of focused again and quite calm and spacious. So in that, you've seen the cycle of that, that state being born, doing its thing, living its life and fading out. You've witnessed the whole, the whole life cycle of that emotion. And during that time, that emotion has been fully accepted. That regret, uh, you know, you're uh, having got angry or the, the desire to express more anger, <laughs> whatever it might be, that you've, you've seen that and known that angry feeling or that resentful feeling or that regretful feeling as it is. So, and, and, and there's the direct recognition. This is a mind state. It arises, it passes away. That's all. So then, the more we do that in the quiet of our own meditation and with the other person not in the room, when they are in the room and there is an interaction and you find yourself getting sucked into the same kind of pattern, then some, something in you knows, oh, this is just that angry feeling. This is that resentful feeling. And you can, in the midst of a conversation, you can turn part of your attention back to your body and go, oh yeah, here's that, that tightness in my stomach. Here's that steel bar across my shoulders. There it is. And so part of the mind is able to recognize this is just that reactive process. That's what this is. And so in that moment, you're able to be more in tune with that, uh, that situation. And that um, the, uh, so it brings about a, a real letting go. That there's a, oh, look at that. It's just that angry reaction. And so that the, there's a, um, a, a lack of entanglement and, and grasping you know, involved in that. And then just repeat a thousand times. Yeah. <laughs> I can't, you need a microphone. Is that why, why they say... It's, yeah. Okay, you're on, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Is that why, why they say if you have um, achieved 3M2, you will be very happy? Because you know it's just a process. Yes. It arise and fades away. That's fades it. Away. The more we develop the anicca sanya, the perception of impermanence, that's a direct uh, development of wisdom. But when you're caught, when the mind is caught in that tense relationship of being obsessed with something, worried about something, irritated by something, then we don't see the anicca of it. But the mind is lost in that's a real thing, and there's uh, there's no perspective on it. So, please, any other questions? So, yes, right next to you. There. Um, just going back to your talk, at the end, um, you describe that uh, trusting in the in in the present in present awareness was uh, a path to letting go. Mm -hmm. um, when I try to practice this, uh, especially if I'm having problems at work specifically, there's a sense of fear in me. Uh, fear that if I stop reflecting or sort of trying to work out what will happen in the future, that something terrible will happen. <laughs> um, and I wondered if you could perhaps um, talk a little bit more about cultivating this trust in the, in the present, present awareness. Yeah, very good question. Um, well, the, the more that self-view is involved, then the unknown the future is threatening. And so we fill up that, that, that unknown with a plan, with a belief, with a worry. The, the, even having a collection of horrible possibilities for sometimes is much better than a complete emptiness. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a bit of a simplification, but I would say that the, 
the more that the, there is self-view, sakaya ditti, then the more the unknown is intrinsically threatening. And I want that unknown to be filled up with something so that I will know, well, I will have a plan, or I will have some kind of sense of security for, to protect me. So that's, and, and then I would want to, to, to fill up the unknown or to be distracted from that, just like eat something, go somewhere, talk to someone, anything <laughs> to get away from that. So we either try and fill it up or get away from it. But those are all self-based reactions, I would say. They're kind of, they're natural enough and familiar enough, um, but they don't, they don't really, they don't, certainly don't liberate um, so the, when there's less self-view or freedom from self-view, then the unknown isn't threatening. It's mysterious. There's a quality of wonderment and mystery. Um, and so it's, it's, like, uh, it's, it's strange, but the development of wisdom comes through the conscious cultivation of uncertainty. So like if you've read uh, or listened to any of Ajahn Chah's teachings, he calls this the standard of the noble ones is not sure. You deliberately make it, remind yourself that it's not a sure thing. So you're consciously remembering, recollecting that the future is uncertain. So you're kind of, to, to, to uh, strengthen that quality of wisdom uh, and to go against the self-centered habits as a deliberate kind of threatening of the ego. <laughs> so that uh, he greatly encouraged that uh, conscious contemplation of uncertainty. Um, if it's uh, deliberately brought to mind and there's the context of the understanding of not-self, then it, it, uh, uh, it can be or it should be something that is then liberating because it's going against the, the habit of mind that's trying to find some security. But uh, as he would say quite regularly, if you seek for security in that which is insecure, you have to be disappointed. I mean, he, he was a genius at these sort of one-sentence, world-stopping insights. <laughs> but it's, that's, it's as simple as that. If we seek for security in that which is insecure, we have to be disappointed. If you seek for certainty in that which is uncertain, we have to be disappointed because it, it, it's not there. So uh, stop looking for certainty in that which is uncertain. So then, that if that's cultivated in a skillful way, then it steadily goes against the habits of self-view. You can't just snap your fingers and make the mind, you know, drop all egotistical habits. <laughs> it, it can't, it's not a matter of will, but it's a, the essence of insight meditation, really, and the development of the insight into anicca, dukkha, anatta, uh, uncertainty, unsatisfactoriness, and not self is to undermine and dissolve those, the, the habits of self-view, self-centered thinking. Um, so that, but uh, kind of going back to what I was talking about, that practice of conscious clinging, um, highlighting our neuroses is a great way of dismantling them. You know, like, oh, if I knew exactly what was going to happen, I would be totally happy. And you can't get to the end, of the, yeah, you know, you're smiling, like you can't get to the end of the sentence before you, you realize, oh yeah, right, sure. It's not that way. You know, in a, in a wordless, non-conceptual, direct intuition, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> but uh, it, so but by highlighting that, kind of highlighting the delusion, the limitations of it, or the delusory, delusory nature of it, is is known directly. It's it's obvious. It's not conceptual. It's not just an, an idea about it. It's a knowing. Oh, this shoe does not fit. Ow! <laughs> these these are not my glasses. I can't see. It's not a concept. It's like these are not my glasses. Yeah. So that um, that I find is a really helpful kind of practice. So it's conscious use of wise reflection. It's like Yoni So Manasikara, uh, Dhamma Vijaya, that you're, you're using the reflective ability of the mind to h challenge those habits. And so that when you see them arising, if you develop that, that kind of reflection, like in the workplace, oh, uh, 
if if I did everything that the boss wants, then the bo my boss would be totally happy, and that would be good. And <laughs> you, know, you know, your boss would find something else to be unhappy about. You know, you know that. Not just finding fault with the boss, but that's how humans are. That's how we are. So I hope that makes makes some sense. Thank you. It does. So, any questions from this side? I don't want to just favour the folks on the left. Yes, there's one. The red shirt guy. So get you off. Um, Arjun, a couple of weeks ago you talked about neutrinos and popular science. Yes. And the cosmologists tell us that the way this all ends is that space goes out infinitely and then each particle of carbon or iron is too far away for the next one to react. And um, I was thinking about your talk of dependent origination. And then I was thinking, well, if it's too far for each particle to react, there'll be no ignorance, and then there'll be no contact, and there'll be no feelings, and no, uh, uh, and, and no becoming, and no birth, and death, and suffering. And I thought, well, goodness me, perhaps the Buddha's onto something, and everything. <laughs> Everyone in this room and everything on the universe will eventually reach Nibbana. And I was clinging, it made me very happy, that thought, for about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, am I right to cling to that? Is, is, a, is a happy thought, or have I drifted into annihilationism? Uh, that I think it's tilting towards annihilationism. But uh, that, uh, that I think the book I was referring to, um, or some of the statistics I was referring to is in a book by a, an author, a very good science writer called Katie Mack, called The End of Everything. And uh, it's, it's very, very readable. Um, if you have anxiety problems about everything ending, don't read that book. Because <laughs> it really is about the end of everything. And, um, but uh, um, in, in Buddhist psychology, or Buddhist cosmology, more accurately, um, it... Uh, the the model is that of big bangs and big crunches, which is one of the cosmological forms that people talk about. And uh, folks like Roger Penrose uh, actually talk about sort of that infinite expansion. But then uh, Roger Penrose's theory, um, which I forget the name of, um, I think it's it's got the initials CCC. But anyway, um, but it's like there's a certain point where all those particles kind of separate from each other and stop affecting each other, and then that somehow initiates the next Big Bang in Roger Penrose's brilliant logic. <laughs> and so that they have a succession of, of universes. So in, but in, in the, the Buddhist cosmology, the, the languaging is uh, infinite cycles of universal expansion and contraction. So that uh, the, the, the universe expands to a certain limit, then it contracts and collapses, and then it expands again, and then collapses. And in those times, when there's a physical collapse, because it's not just a physical universe, but also it's uh, there's the mental dimension as well. And so in Buddhist cosmology, when there is that time of universal collapse, sort of the time between, uh, between universes, which in Nordic mythology was called the Chinunga Gap, which they had a sense of as well in the Nordic mythology, Norse mythology, um, the gap between universes. Um, and in the Buddhist cosmology, all beings are born in the Abhasara Brahma realm or higher. So all of us, all beings, we have a, a holiday up in the Brahma realms between universes. And then when another big bang happens and the physical universe comes into being again, sort of reforms, then um, bit by bit then beings get born into the, the physical realms and picking up uh, material form and consciousness associated with that. So um, that uh, I, 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 I like to play with ideas myself. So I'm um, fully in support of you kind of ooh, following things through and imagining how it might work out. But uh, the, the sort of standard Buddhist model, if you like, is that of uh, infinite cycles. And also there's a part of that is that um, Buddhism is one of the uh, few religions where the Buddha, where the teacher says, the, the, when people ask about the ultimate origin of things, he says 
that is uh, imponderable. Achin, uh, achinteya, it's one of the four imponderables, is the ultimate beginning of things. Um, and that it's a, it, there's a whole collection, in the connected discourses, there's a whole, uh, uh, a whole series of suttas uh, entitled On the Undiscoverable Beginning. So that it's not that it began and then we just can't know about it, but our whole concept of beginning and it, what it is, is way outside of the imaginative process. Our, our minds don't have enough dimensions to encompass the reality. So the Buddha uh, so it said he'd use those kind of terms like imponderable, achinteya, or uh, undiscover, and it's undiscoverable. So uh, he says it's not as though we haven't got the power to to look back into the past. We can, but how everything began. It's like well, time location, actuality, all these things are very much seen through the lens of our human experience and the actuality of, of how the, the experiential world, physical, mental, spiritual, uh, how that has uh, originated uh, originally <laughs> uh, is, uh, is beyond anything that's conceivable. So that can be frustrating to our thinking mind, like, yeah, but I want to know, I need the facts, or the, there must be a way you can describe it. It's like, the, the whole, it's just like asking what happened before the Big Bang. Well, if time began at the Big Bang, then the, in that, that cosmological model, then there isn't a before. Or what went bang at the Big Bang? <laughs> so the... Uh, I feel in that respect, it's very useful to consider the Buddha's teaching on the handful of leaves. He said, what, what, he picked up a handful of leaves from the forest floor and he asked the monks that were with him, what is greater in number, the leaves in my hand or the leaves in the forest? And it's a kind of rhetorical question. So, he said, well, venerable sir, the leaves in your hand are very few in number and the leaves in the forest are very, very numerous. He said, exactly. What I know is comparable to all the leaves in the forest. What I teach you is comparable to the leaves in my hand. What do I teach you? Suffering, origin, cessation, and path. That's what I teach. Why? Because that's what leads to liberation. The other stuff I don't teach you because it doesn't lead to liberation. But I think you probably would be interested in Katie Mack's book. So probably safe, again, safety warning. <laughs> in case you're prone towards nihilism and depression. Uh, this uh, was from an over here with the pink shirt. had it. A question. Yeah, thank you very much for your teaching and um, also this little book that I read yesterday, which uh, about um, don't push, use the weight of your own body, which I absolutely loved. And um, I'm just, my question today is what you've been talking about, attachment and non-attachment and maybe overdoing or overly attached or overly, and how that links to the middle way, your teaching around the middle way or the Buddhist teaching around the middle way. If you could link those concepts for me, that I'd appreciate. Uh, well, uh, good question. The, the way I like to, to describe it, let's find something. Oh. So, have we got the, the bell striker? Got the, the bell and the bell striker nearby? So, when we think about the two extremes, say like uh, um, to to uh, um, uh, to attach or to let go, or um, to to act or to to not act, just the just the striker. There we go. Thank you very much. So if we think of the, the two extremes, so to act, to not act, to attach, to let go, uh, to, to be, not to be. So we, we think of the middle way as sort of um, acting sometimes and being passive sometimes, or you know, attaching sometimes and and letting go sometimes. So we think of the middle way as sort of halfway along the arc, 
in a normal sense, or um, uh, you know, the not being a, a, a say, uh, uh, or, or if when we're thinking of things in a materialistic way. But uh, so the, the middle, the middle way in terms of the Buddhist principle is not just fifty-fifty. Uh, sometimes people say, well, "I like to practice the middle way with regards to the fifth precept." So I drink some of the time and I don't drink. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I have days off, so I practice the middle way. That's the kind of halfway along the arc concept. But I would say the middle, the, the middle way is actually the point where the extremes pivot from. So it's that's the, the middle is really the the central point where the two extremes emerge from. So that, uh, and that's representing that quality of awakened awareness that's attuned to the, the present reality so that it's, it's not just acting or not acting 50-50 of the time, but that the, if the mind is focused on the, the center, the pivot, then that, that in a way it's, it's, you know, all analogies are partially accurate. But that it's it's not the, the middleness is not uh, it's, it's not looking at things in ter- in worldly terms, but the middleness comes from the the, the view uh, uh, the source of of the view, and that is from that uh, quality of awakened awareness, free of, of ego and uh, and I me eye making and mind making. So that makes sense. Could you say that that's um, an integrative place? We are able to integrate both sides. With the 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 and and with that link to duality, polarity, paradox. Um, that integrative place, the one plus one is three, where you're able to bring both together in your consciousness um, and hold both. Well, yes, it's in a way that the 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 mind is attuned to the present reality, and then. Whether to speak or to not speak, or to act or to not act, is in response uh, to that. So it's, it's holding both those polarities or possibilities of doing something, not doing something, taking action, being quiet. Those potentialities are there in equal measure, and then the the, the choice uh, to to um, uh, of how to how to respond in each moment is coming from that attunement. So it's what I like to call a self-adjusting system. And that quality of awareness, that's the integrative agent. So uh, that uh, when there is that quality of awakened awareness, then the, the system adjusts itself in the most harmonious and perfect way. So that, and I like to use the, the life of the Buddha as an example. So after the Buddha's enlightenment, then his, the rest of his life, the next 45 years, was a, an ongoing, like a continuous responsivity to the, the time, the place, the situation, and also to p- potentialities. So his choice is to, to go back to, uh, to, to see King Bimbisara in Rajagaha, and then to visit uh, King Pasenadi in, in Kosala, or then to go back to uh, Kapilavatu when he was invited by yeah, one of the, the emissaries from, from his family to, to go back. And... Uh, the establishment of the Sangha and the, and the Vinaya discipline and all of that came as responses to, to time and place and situation. He wasn't kind of looking to, to, uh, to create a sort of fixed project, but there was a responsivity um, according to the situation. Also that he never pushed things. Uh, and this is a, another aspect of his, his teaching style that I, I feel sometimes is overlooked. But you know he had immense psychic power, and and, and oh, just like physical psychological presence, he was a big guy, and powerful presence. He could make an impact just through his words, let alone psychic powers. But he didn't force situations, so that there's numerous times where he gave advice, and then the person said, "No, I don't agree," or "No thanks," or "No, I'm going to do it my way." He would make his input three times. And if the person still refused his input or, or, um, or wouldn't uh, accept what he was saying, he would say, okay, fine. And he would just leave it, he'd walk away and leave them to it. He wouldn't uh, say, look, if you do this, X, Y, Z is going to happen. Let me show you. And then and create a kind of, uh, sort of psychic display of, of the future. Uh, he never did that. He let people make their own choices. 
even when there were there was painful consequences he would say you know, don't do that or this is not a good idea and uh, he would make his input three times and then leave it so i feel also that's a part of responsivity is like don't push <laughs> just use the weight of your own body it's a very very buddhist principle even the tathagata himself he didn't push he made his input sometimes he he deliberately went into situations where he thought he could make a difference so he would in his oftentimes it describes doing his walking meditation in the in the early morning and he realizes oh so and so is ripe for enlightenment and then he'd make the journey to that particular park or that particular town and just happen to show up <laughs> and then they would meet but then uh, and then a, a dialogue or a, an encounter would would arise but he wouldn't control that or fix that or or or, or force it in, in any way but he would show up and then allow things to unfold um and so that uh, i feel that's a very helpful um indicator for us in our lives to uh to not force situations or use our personal power or authority to 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 force a, a point of view or an opinion or or, or kind of a uh a demand upon somebody or some people but rather you make your input you do the best you can and if people are determined to go a different way okay not because you don't care you know you do care but they are they they're determined to 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 do this okay let them let them go with it and see what happens and so uh to me that's that's a powerful teaching even when the buddha realized this is going to be painful <laughs> sounds like he would just leave them to it and and then see whether they learned the lesson or they didn't learn the lesson thank you so maybe one last question from our friend here in the blue shirt Thank you very much Pante for the inspirational talk. Uh, I just have a very s- simple clarification from yourself. You mentioned about four attachment, you mentioned a sutta also like conventions to con- views, mm-hmm. opinions and sensual pleasure. How does it sit with the sabba sutta, bhava sava, kama sava, ditta sava and avijja sava? Uh it's very close. So that um uh, d- the the uh, the word asava means an outflow um so the sabasava sutta um is i think the the second discourse of the majjhima nikaya the all the outflows or all, all of the um, sometimes the uh, fermentations so uh, sometimes because the word asava it both implies flowing and it implies rot so uh, ib horner translated asava as canker a kind of suppurating infection or a kind of boil or a a, a um uh, that kind of um uh, uh, that kind of tone uh, ajahn tanisro tra- translates asava as effluence which makes one think of a sewer pipe but uh, i think outflows is uh, my favorite translation so the outflows uh, karma asava sense desire bhava asava becoming dit asava views and opinions avijasava ignorance so uh, i would say it's very closely aligned to um those four kinds of, of clinging you know the, the buddha's teaching is not systematic you know it's not uh, uh it's, you know the um there there are uh, with say the dependent the teaching on dependent origination you've got about nine different formats throughout the suttas that don't all quite match each other <laughs> uh some like some some renditions of dependent origination have got extra links some have got less links some of them have got so sort of different wordings so that it's not exactly the same but i would say it's covering the same kind of area it's like the the channels of outflow where the mind gets lost so um the uh, in the the four kinds of clinging it highlights like atavada you know clinging to clinging to your own story and i think that in terms of of our human experience it's like well yeah that's there's a lot of that we get we're very fond of our own name we 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 our, our experience or our family our, our family story uh, our career our relationships our successes our failures 
that there's a strong in our minds. So the atavada, the way of the self, that uh, that's a, a strong kind of attachment. So you could say, well, that's also closely related to uh, avijasava, the outflow of ignorance, just the, the habit of identification. But atavada is a bit more specific. So I feel the um, it's useful to take those kind of things into our own meditation say, okay, well, how do those line up? Or how do that fit together? Are those the same things? Do they relate? Do they not relate? How do they relate? And I feel that's quite fertile ground. And sometimes you find, I, I usually find uh, if you're comparing different areas, usually you get sort of three out of four are a good match. And then one is like, well, it doesn't quite fit, but yeah, close enough. <laughs> so like uh, one, of, one of the books uh, of mine is called uh, For the Love of the World. And uh, I brought together the four elements and the four foundations of mindfulness. So three out of the four are a close fit. And the, other, the fourth one is a bit of a fudge. But, but I find that just that lining those things up together and contemplating, those can be a fruitful area for, for investigation. And to, uh, to say, oh, okay, are they, they're somewhat related or how are they connected? So we're using our own uh, our own a capacity for wise reflection to to clarify the picture. If it's just an exercise in trying to be clever and impress people or write a, a doctorate, then it's not very useful. <laughs> but if we're using it to uh, to highlight things, so like uh, that, it, the for the love of the world, that book came from a series of of, of talks I was invited to give at a local center in near yeah, Abayagiri Monastery in California. There'd been a huge uh, oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, and the people were really kind of upset and distressed by the ecological damage caused by that. So the people at the yoga center asked, "Could I give a series of talks about Buddhism and ecology and, uh, and eco preservation and such like?" So then, contemplating about well, talking about the material world. Okay, the four elements: earth, water, fire, and wind. That makes sense in terms of contemplating the world. The material world, and then, but also in terms of our practice and what to do with our life and our mind, then the four foundations of mindfulness are very relevant. And so, then contemplating that, I thought, and then just saying, okay, I wonder how those line up with each other. And so, then, uh, as I said, you could find three out of the four seem to be quite well aligned, and the, the fourth one was a bit of a fudge, but you know, you can uh, can uh, play with it. So, like the. Um, if I remember correctly, then they had the um, uh, Kayan Upasana uh, related to um, the, the, the contemplation of the body relating to the earth element, Patavidatu, and then the, um, uh, the um, let's see, what was it, the Vayodhatu, uh, the, uh, the air element uh, related to the... Um, uh, foundation of mindfulness, contemplation of uh, avanicca, dhamma anupasana, and then uh, vedana. I uh, aligned with um, uh, let's see with the um, the water element uh, with feeling, and then uh, uh, the uh, the the fire element uh, apod uh, 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 tejodatu. Uh, I aligned with with mind states. So I think, if I, I, I did the book a long time ago, but uh, so that uh, uh, just a way of exploring uh, both the f foundations of mindfulness and the four elements and just uh, uh, say looking into that and weighing those things up and seeing how those teachings might align with each other. So that their copies are available, I think, uh, off the shelves here. Uh, you can take a look. But that whole process, the reason why I mention it, is that kind of process of taking the teachings and exploring them, yes, having feeling like it's not heretical or crazy or, or useless, but rather to take the teachings and to bring them alive and sort of match that against your own experience can be a very valuable thing. So we'll leave it there for today. We've gone past four o'clock already, so let's uh, draw things to a close.